This morning, we have the privilege of having Pastor Brad come and chat with us. Now, I said that in first service, and Brad reeled, Pastor, oh no, but you know the definition of a pastor is a shepherd, a teacher, someone that loves the flock. That guy does. Our elder, our pastor Brad, prays for you guys. He's on his knees constantly. He truly loves the Lord. And I'd like to uh, have Brad come up and pour into us uh, this message that being, <laughs> kind of being rookies at this message preparation thing. Brad, it took you, what, three weeks, four weeks on this message to put this together, but it's a good one. You'll enjoy this. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to reflect on how we have this ability to gather here and assemble here freely and worship our Lord. And to all you veterans, I want to say thank you. And uh, this Memorial Day weekend is more than a weekend of celebration. We have to think that all gave some and some gave all, that we can be here now. And I don't ever want that to be taken lightly. So thank you, veterans. And um, the reason I'm here is because I want to talk about shepherding. And we have that privilege to talk about shepherding because Jesus gave all. He gave himself totally and completely to us as our shepherd. And um, we're going to go through a little bit of John 21. And the reason I've chosen that scripture is because when I was reading the Bible, it read me. And uh, there's a self-application. Whenever I'm looking at this, there's a self-application. And uh, one of the things that kind of prompted me to do what I don't do very well, which is publicly speak, was my friend Alex sitting on the back row over here who told me that some years back when he had received the Lord, the pastor told him, he says, one of these days your mother, or your brother, or your sister are going to come to you and they're going to say, who are you? Who are you? And he said about a following week later, probably in early in his college days, he, uh, he said his mother walked in the room and says, who are you? I don't know who you've become. And what had happened to him was this, this was a, a shepherding church that he had been attending, had filled his heart with the Holy Spirit and transformed him. The religious life was no longer suitable. The Christian life was a must. Thank you, Alex. But um, today I want to talk a little bit about Peter, but before we do that, I really want us to stop and lift up Tim in prayer. And so if you guys would just bow your head, eyes closed, head bowed, I just want to say, Lord, thank you for the shepherd that you have made, Pastor Tim. And thank you for the fact that we have news that is not bad news. Lord, I just uh, ask your hand of peace upon him right now as he struggles with anxiety. And Lord, whatever it is that you want to teach him in this time, would you reveal yourself to him in your fullness? Use all things together for good, as your word promises in Romans 8, 28. So Lord, I just uh, thank you now that we have this opportunity to freely assemble and worship you. And I thank you for the men and women who to put their life on the line to protect the freedom that we enjoy. And I ask right now, Lord, that you protect the men and women all around this world that lift up the name of Jesus Christ. No matter what church it's in, if it's halfway around the corner or halfway around the world, I just pray now that you bring blessing and protection upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I just uh, have to think about Peter. You know, Peter, Peter's Peter. You know, a big old burly guy who lived a, lived a tough life. And um, he was a little bit outspoken, and he usually put his foot in his mouth. You know, I can relate to that. But I'll talk more about Peter here in a minute. But I, I titled this sermon, Who is Your Shepherd? Who is your shepherd? And last week, I just was thinking about Josh, the paraplegic that goes to church here, how he he, he talked to us, he ministered uh, to us through John 8, saying that Jesus is the gate. And all that go through him go into eternal salvation. And uh, I just want to make about 
seven points here shortly on, the, on John 21. But John writes in John 21, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or Galilee if you wish. And it happened this way. Now, I just reading this, think to myself, what gives John this authority to say it happened this way? You know, he don't use like, I heard it happened this way or it might have. No, he says it happened this way because John, not who he was, but what he was, he was an eyewitness. He was an eyewitness to what happened. And he did not hesitate. He does not stutter when he says it happened this way to the point that all the disciples gave their life because it happened this way. Simon Peter called Didymus, or twin, or quate. <clears throat> Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and I don't know why it doesn't mention the sons of Zebedee's name here, but they were James and John. And the other disciples were together, and Peter says, I'm going out to fish. And so they said, we'll go with you. And they went in the boat, and they went out that night, and they caught nothing. Now, I don't know how many times I have had a knee-jerk, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And, um, you know, my net came up empty. You got to remember now that Simon Peter, his dad Jonah, Andrew, his brother, James and John, well, they were commercial fishermen. And they fished all night for a very good reason. Does anybody remember what the very good reason is that they fish at night? Because they sell the fish in the morning. There's no refrigeration. We don't think about the fact that these had to be fresh fish. And you also have to remember that this band of fishermen were lost. They were empty. They were lonely. They were confused. They'd been three years at Jesus' side under his personal discipleship, under his personal hand, eye to eye, listening to their heartbeat. And Peter is fully aware of his denial and his verbal betrayal. Now for early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore but his disciples did not recognize him. They didn't realize it was him. And he called out to them, friends, do you have any fish? Now did he have to ask them that? He knew they didn't have no fish. And no, they replied. So he tells them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And they did so. And they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. And I have to ask myself again, this self-application thing of the scripture is just killing me. But uh, I have to ask myself, how many times have I acted out of impulse and my net came up empty? And when was it that I heard the voice of Christ saying, throw your net out on the correct side of life. Throw your net out on the right side of life. And you will find some you will find some peace. And wow, my life overflowed. Then the disciple who loved Peter said, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard this, say he is Lord, he wrapped his outer garment, what we call a shirt, around him and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in a boat, towing the net full of fish, because they were not far from shore, about 100 yards or so. Now, put yourself in Peter's position. Your heart aches, you've been feeling empty and hopeless and depressed, and you feel that the Lord has left you. You've witnessed His resurrection, you've failed Him in thought, word, and deed. But Peter does not run from Jesus. Peter jumps in not concerned with the depth of the water, the length of the swim. He's focused on the Lord and he swims to him. And I am still tempted to run when I know 
that the only running we need to do is to the Lord Jesus. And when they landed, they saw a fire burning. A bed of burning coals with a fish on it and some bread. Now, it's ironic that Jesus uses the burning coals as a reminder of the fire he stood by on his final denial that night. Warming himself, he smells the smoke. Jesus makes no mistake in, in what he's doing. And he tells them, bring me some fish. And so Peter climbed aboard the boat and drug it net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. Yet the net was not torn. And then Jesus told them, now listen to this, because this is an important part. It's the invitation. Jesus tells them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus took the bread and gave it to them, and the same with some fish. And this was the third time he had appeared to them in his resurrected body. Now wrap your mind around this if you can. These men have witnessed Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now in his resurrected body, he stands in front of them preparing a meal for them and they eat. When he'd finished eating, he said this is Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you more than these. He says, then feed my lambs. This was the agape, self-sacrificial love when he asked him, do you love me? And again, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But by this time, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? The love we're talking about here is for Leo. Leo is the love of a brother. And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And why the third time? Why was Peter hurt on the third time? Three times he denied him. And Jesus knew he had to crush that prideful spirit. He knew Peter was going to have to be broken. And Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, and you went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands, and someone will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And where was Peter going with his hands stretched out, dressed in prison garb? He was going to the cross. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death in which he, Peter would glorify God. But then he said this most important thing. He said, follow me. Now, please hear this because if you're going to be in any sort of Christian leadership role, you've got to be a follower. Jesus commands Peter, follow me. You see, Peter was a fisherman by trade. But this day, he had a career change. On that shoreline, Jesus commissioned him as an evangelist. His bold voice, outspoken behavior, his trust in the Lord eventually made Peter to be one of the first to preach after the resurrection. And after taking this apart and looking at this scripture and having it, this Bible read me there's some things I took away from this I just want to share with you. Because as youngsters we're taught different things. And a lot of it has to do with our accountability. And God's going to get you. And you're in trouble. But what does Jesus not do? What does he not do here? He's eye to eye with Peter and he does not bring up his past. He does not mention his failure, his shortcomings, his pride, 
his denial, the lopping off of Malchus' ear, nothing. He doesn't give Peter a list of Christian rules and principles. The abbreviation of that is C-R-A-P. Christian <laughs> rules and principles. He doesn't give him that. He doesn't order him to start a religious organization. Now, if you've got a little bit of Catholic background, you know what I'm talking about. Because it was taught to us that that was what Jesus told Peter to start the Catholic Church. But the truth is, he just told him to start his church. Catholic Church didn't come for centuries later. But what does Jesus do? The thing that amazes me about this here is that Jesus' only concern and confrontation with him is love. He says, do you love me? Because God is love, Jesus is God, and Jesus is love. The person of grace gives grace and reinstates Peter as his chosen servant. A leadership role is powered by love for the guidance and protection of Jesus' sheep. Now that Jesus has commanded his sheep be cared for, what are the needs of a sheep? If we're sheep, which we are, Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. She, sheep's lives require, require the shepherd's protection. And a sheep, in order to lay down and be content, it has to be fear, fearless. It has to be free of fear. There's nothing worse for a sheep than fear. And it can't have friction with its others. In the farming life, in chickens, there's a pecking order. And in the sheep life, it's a butting order. They butt each other around. And there's friction amongst them. And they can't rest. And they cannot be full of parasites. In other words, what's bugging you? If you've got something bugging at you, gnawing on you, you won't lay down. And the most important thing, it has to be free of hunger and thirst. These four needs have to be met in order for a sheep to find rest and lay down, relax and flourish. A flock that is restless, dense, content, agitated and disturbed never does well. The slightest suspicion of danger causes a sheep to want to run. They're defenseless. They're feeble. They're weak. And the only recourse is to run. When threatened, nothing calms a flock as much as hearing the voice of the master. The owner and protector puts them at ease as nothing else can. He makes me lie down. Who makes me lie down? Who is your shepherd? In the Christian life, there's no substitute for the peaceful awareness of the omnipresence of the shepherd. Knowing he's nearby, there's no real, there's nothing else that can dispel the fear and the panic and the terror of the unknown. And we as sheep will go through life with unknown. We as sheep will go through new troubles. We as sheep will be in danger and hazards. We as sheep will either live in anxiety and fear, or we as sheep will find peaceful rest. Which one is it? John 10, 14 reads like this. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lie down my life for them. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay my life down only to take it up again. No one can take it from me. I lay it down on my accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I have received from the Father. But the unbelievers of that day and age, the doubters pushed him, saying, if it's true, tell us you are the Messiah. And Jesus tells him so. Jesus answers, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish so no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them from my Father's hand. And the Father and I are one. So again I ask, who's your shepherd? Who's your master? What's your master? Does the shepherd know your name? Do you know your shepherd's name? And are you prepared to be a leader by being a follower? Do you understand that he chooses to use you to shepherd through? He's still the master. He will shepherd through you to his sheep. Author Philip Keller writes this in his book, Lessons from a Sheepdog. He says, God has no hands in the world but our hands. He has no feet here but our feet, and He has no lips here but our lips. Remember, our Master chooses to carry on His purpose through the fallible agency of common people. Acts 4.13 will tell you another incident of fallible people doing miracles and the scripture notes that the people were amazed because they were ordinary men. He uses ordinary people to accomplish his great design. Look at it this way. We see the enormous honor he bestows on us as his chosen co-workers. Now back to Simon Peter. Of course his name was Simon and he was named Peter by Jesus. Which we know means the rock. But uh, Peter had an unusual opportunity in his day and age because he lived on the, both sides of the cross. He lived on the B.C. side and the A.D. side. The law side, the grace side. He was slightly older than Jesus by about a year or so. He was a strong, tough man, a man's man. Commercial fishing was tough and physically demanding. Fishermen were rough, vile, vulgar men with boisterous tempers and little fear, as oftentimes they'd be captured by storms and their boats be capsized. Peter was bold but often wrong. He rebuked the Lord by saying that he would die for him just to betray him and deny him three times. A sinful man, he told Jesus in Luke 5, 8, Go away from me, Lord, as I am a sinful man. Peter was married. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew were the first disciples. Luke 5, 9 through 11, I'll tell you And Jesus said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets and followed. I oftentimes think about this big burly guy and just pulling his boat ashore and Jesus saying, come with me. 
He drops his nets and walks off. And the next fisherman comes up, oh, look, free net. <laughs> oh, no, no, that belongs to Peter. No, don't touch that. Because that's the kind of guy I was. Peter was the first to call Jesus the son of the living God and the Messiah. He was the first to preach at Pentecost. And he was the first to proclaim Christ to the Gentiles. He witnessed along with John and James the transfiguration. He was he seen the true identity of Jesus peeled back in the Shekinah glory. Peter suffered persecution, imprisonment, beatings, and the execution of his wife, who was also martyred. It was said that Peter rejoiced as his wife was led to her death. And he rejoiced on the day of his earthly death, knowing that he would be reunited with Jesus. And what I've learned in this little study that I went through to give you this message is that Jesus himself chose Peter and you and me. He chose you and me and he tells us, take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. Now we as people would look at Peter and what we'd see would be the man side of him. We'd see his flesh. We'd see that he was totally unqualified. A vile man, he says. You see, Jesus doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. John 13, 10. In chapter 13, John's speaking to his disciples. And then he takes a towel and wraps around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began washing his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel he had wrapped around them. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, although not every one of you are here, speaking of Judas. You see, Jesus washed Peter's sins away, like he has for you and me. But he didn't do it with the water in the basin. He did it with his blood on the cross. He qualified Jesus. Jesus qualified Peter through the blood of the cross and he qualifies you and I through the blood of the cross to be his shepherds. Who is your shepherd? Who is your shepherd? Stop thinking he's mad at you. Stop having thoughts that he's judging your past. Stop judging others. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, oh Brad, but I remember when you were young. I do too. But Jesus doesn't. I'm on a different stratus in Christ. As Peter, Jesus deals with us in the demonstration of love. Love, not anger. God is love. Stop driving down the road of life focused on the rearview mirror. Life is too short. It's not where you're going. He looks to where you're going. He
he leads you into green pasture. We need to stop choosing barren land. We need to not be eating of bitter weeds and thorny thistle. We don't need to be drinking the polluted water of the world of self-pride, self-help. Jesus made a custom walk for Peter. And he has a custom walk for you and for me. Author Philip Keller writes a lot about shepherds. And he writes this here. And I just feel it implies and applies so much to we as sheep. He writes, a hungry, ill-fed sheep is ever on its feet, on the move, searching for another scanty mouthful of forage to try to satisfy its gnawing hunger. Such sheep are not content. They do not thrive. They are no use to themselves or to their owners. They languish and lack vigor and vitality. Who is your shepherd? Who have you entrusted your life to? Who leads you? (coughs) Father, I just ask you to remove anything from the minds of these people that was not of you. Lord, I just ask you to bless your sheep this moment. I thank you that you're the good shepherd. I thank you that you've called us. Now let us be shepherds through your mighty hand, I pray. Amen.